Hello and welcome at Depot. My name is Jono Moro. Uh, I'm from Depot and uh, a special warm welcome to, to Critcross and of course our guest today, Katie Chukov. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you Klaus Speidel for organizing this e event with us. And uh, yeah, it's, it's the last event for this year, uh, the last Crit Cross. We are ha very happy that you're here uh, also in the live stream. Uh, for that, please also feel free to, to post your questions into the live stream and we will read them. Um, and if you from the audience don't want to be heard in the discussion on the live stream, then just refuse to take the microphone I will offer you, please. <laughs> yeah, so that's all from me and uh, thank you very much for coming and have a, an interesting evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. We are very happy to be back at Depot for this Crit Cross. Um, my name is Klaus Speidel. I'm one of the co-founders of Verein K, which we founded in 2018. In 17, we started the first Crit Cross took place in 2018. I just checked in May. And uh, it's one of our three programs. Uh, the other programs are visiting critics and visiting curator programs where we bring international critics and curators to Vienna and Crit Cross is kind of the program that happens throughout the year. And every time we invite every time we choose text and several times a year we also invite international art writers, critics and in the beginning it was really focused purely on art criticism but it has developed, now we are on the 18th edition already of Crit Cross, so quite some time to develop and now we are also inviting editors and as is the case of Kitty Chukrov, more an essayist, a theorist, art theorist than purely an art critic as she as she told me early on in our conversations. And um, Kitty Chukrov holds a, um, a doctorate in philosophy, is a visiting professor at Hochschule der Künste in Karlsruhe and a professor at the Department of Cultural Studies at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. She was a Marie uh, Curie Fellow in Wolverhampton in the UK and has authored numerous texts on art theory and philosophy. Maybe I'll just mention her latest full-length book, which is uh, Practicing the Good, Desire and Boredom in Soviet uh, Socialism. And um, for this conversation, Katie will introduce a little bit the context of the text that she has suggested we read. For those who haven't been at Crit Cross in the past, we always have a few texts, so it's really a reading and discussion group. That's what makes it a bit different from um, most of the ordinary formats. It's a way to you know, take seriously this form of writing, uh, criticism and critique that happens, that is very rarely discussed as opposed to curating, for instance, where there's a lot of forums on curating at every art fair and on many occasions. Criticism is a bit um, a stepchild that gets rarely discussed as a practice and so it seemed important to us to, to launch uh, this discussion group and um, Katie will introduce uh, the context of the text she suggested for this uh, discussion, which is one that was published in EFLUX. So there are a few excerpts. She thankfully accepted to, to create a few excerpts that could be read you know, in a short time span also at the beginning because we know that not everybody has the time uh, in their busy lives to read it beforehand. So we, we offer this possibility as well. And then uh, we'll discuss the text. You can also jump in with questions or comments. Uh, and in the third part, we'll talk a little bit about the, the title giving uh, idea as well. Um, and that is more based on her book. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's for today. And without further ado, I would invite you to present, Kitty. Thank you yeah, for coming. Thank you, Klaus. And uh, thank you, Dayan. Uh, for invitation and uh, I'm glad to be in this intimate company to discuss things that are uh, quite crucial uh, for me and uh, the suggestion was to discuss the text Evil Surplus Power, the Three Media of Art, uh, which was published a year ago at IFLUX and uh, a little bit touch upon its uh, context and uh, uh, it moves with uh, a, a little bit rough steps 
uh, in terms of certain reconstruction of the genealogy of art and maybe I was uh, wrong in this reconstruction so I would like you to join me in my speculations uh, today and maybe this could be uh, productive for me and for you as well. Um, so I uh, d don't know whether any of you had a look uh, at the text, uh, but generally what was the trigger for me to uh, write it and to discuss the issues um, touched upon there is that um, I always saw the genesis of art in its contemporary condition as negativity and as negative, even despite the social affirmation and social engagement on the one hand. On the other hand, I could never understand why this almost Dadaist negativity uh, and uh, um, dismissal of audience which is inherent to art uh, nowadays ends up with the welcome to the audiences which is of course on the one hand uh, an, an obligation of institutions but nevertheless um, this necessity for public and um, broader audiences to be present in the discussions of artistic practice is crucial today um, um, so that its genesis as radically non-social uh, practice which it was for Adorno for instance or which it was even for Peter Berger on the one hand and on the other hand uh, what art ends up today with almost commissioned art uh, which should be affirmative in its communication with audiences, is a certain sort of controversy uh, which um, uh, I wanted to uh, discuss today. Uh, so just to start with this openness towards public and the focus on the necessity of public to constantly construct public space together with artists and art, um, uh, just to repeat that, uh, I mean, we see um, a very negative attitude to such presences um, in classical texts by Adorno, um, not because he is, uh, he, he does not trust the public who might not understand what happens in art, uh, but to a certain extent to uh, keep art in its negative condition because art failed art failed from the very start and it failed as the practice of the modern enlightenment or even modernist critique of enlightenment and in this sense it is a practice of the failure and this failure should be um, honest uh, in its own self-reflection of this failure also having in mind that the broader socialization or the broader emancipation of the um, um, post-industrial capitalist societies did not happen. Uh, and uh, uh, the similar rebuke to the social context or the social optimism towards art we come across in the works, in the classical work, Theory of Avant-Garde by Peter Berger, who claims that um, uh, simply because uh, dissolution of art in uh, life um, would not be possible in capitalist conditions uh, because uh, they never effectuated uh, the radical emancipation and socialization of certain practices which would make this dissolution or life building or uh, art as socially engaged expansion um, impossible. Um, and now, um, just to mark that uh, the public itself, the idea of the public is not monolithic. It's not that uh, we have certain sort of public space and uh, it's productive, it's good and we deal with it. But um, for me, it has at least three modes. 
um, well, to start with, first, which we already discussed, social engaged of kind of avant-garde type, which presupposes that certain radical transformation took place in the society, and therefore social engagement is the uh, natural consequence of cultural and artistic practices um, in such sociality. Uh, and as I mentioned already, Adorno and Berger are skeptical of this type of social engagement because the emancipation is not full-fledged in contemporary uh, societies. Uh, the second mode of public openness or public space is what Chantal Mouffe calls agon or agonality. And uh, if you remember, uh, she discusses uh, this public space not simply as the presence of the audiences, which sometimes people think that, well, public space is about the presence of audiences and their communication together with the artists, some sort of <coughs> um, adaptation of art uh, in favor of uh, social uh, and public discussion. But uh, what she means here is rather uh, the tension and uh, the uh, also some sort of uh, um, critical tension, which does not mean that cultural producers uh, are simply uh, communicating their production with the audience, but they can as well be, or the artist in this communication can be nasty. So the artist can even be insulting the audience and within this tension, even when the audience is dismissed or uh, negatively rejected, uh, there is some sort of um, a critical mass of um, uh, speculation born. Um, and uh, among such artists, I would mention uh, Artur Zmijewski, for instance. He is an openly uh, socially engaged artist, but at the same time, his rejection of the audience or his negativist or sometimes even nihilist attitude to audiences is also evident. And, uh, well, in this case, uh, Chantal Mouffe even uses the word negativity, even though she inspects this uh, common production between the artist and the public um, in some sort of uh, collaboration. Yet, I would not say that the negativity that she implies uh, would be the same negativity radical and uh, absolute negativity that we come across in Adorno's writing. And then the third mode of publicity would be, well, certain sort of democratic belief that art educates broader masses, and this belief is intertwined with obligations of artistic institutions and museums for broader attendance, and it also deals with certain administrative uh, necessity to um, keep high ratings, etc. So all these modes uh, uh, which I touched upon, they coexist with art's um, negative antisocial uh, genesis. And now I try to explain why at all, or, or why precisely, why I use precisely this term, uh, negative, uh, for those maybe who didn't have chance to look at the text. Um, well, to my mind, um, uh, modernism, which uh, takes origin already in late Romanticist practices, it um, uh, accomplishes the Copernican turn uh, in art, uh, not only in art, but in perception and sensitivity, uh, which presupposes uh, um, lots of things that disappear in art, perspective, figuration, mimetic features, and generally transformation of perception. Uh, this is taking place since late Romanticism, but even more important than, than dispensing with Sinnlichkeit or sensuousness, which is already the case, and the statement of Hegel, which says that, which says that art is over 
because Sinnlichkeit or sensuousness is over in it and it does not deal with this medium anymore. Even more important in this negative genealogy to my mind is uh, the, the shift or the change when art syndrome in pre-modern context was in revealing the truth uh, or dealing with the truth as Hegel tells us and uh, starting with, with romanticism in art's necessity to establish power or to speak with audiences or to speak and articulate one statement via power. Uh, power doesn't mean uh, a straightforward subjugation of someone or somebody, but it means establishing of one's statement regardless of whether this statement is shared or understood and establishment uh, of the influence of this statement within historicity of art. But as well, uh, this presupposes, this shift from the true to the power presupposes also the new role of evil, uh, which uh, I find important because, I mean, uh, evil, uh, to my mind, is something that is the companion or, um, well, companion of art all through its genesis, starting already with the myth of Orth Orpheus, uh, because um, the first mythologies already show us that um, uh, the poet or the artist has to find something in the hell or in the amidst the evil, and only ascending after understanding something in hell or within the evil, so does Parmenides, so does Dante. Uh, the evil becomes this indispensable test for an artist which has to overcome it uh, in certain sense. And all uh, artworks that I mentioned deal with this necessity to first somehow intervene or enter the evil and then come out from it producing something which is a work of art. Uh, why? Because, uh, uh, well, probably precisely mm, this coming out of evil when evil is purified after this coming out with an art object was meant uh, in catharsis. And actually catharsis was the form of purification purification from evil. So evil is necessary and has always been necessary for art because evil um, uh, determines life and determines being. And not touching upon evil would mean that uh, you cannot deal with anything that happens in reality or in life. And therefore, artist is in this effort or attempt some sort of masochist that um, uh, has to deal with with these uh, uh, hellish things, um, um, producing a work of art. And let's remember Nietzsche, who says that art brings the true fictitiously, since the direct transmission of the true could kill. Uh, the the exact phrase is: "We possess art, lest we perish of the truth." Um, and uh, here too we see that acquisition of the true passes through the evil. Um, and next, uh, I mean, probably uh, 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 dealing with evil is also not so uh, naive or not so um, innocent uh, because evil can be attractive and fascinating and its estrangement can as well be fascinating, something that we see attachment to evil and even s evil search of certain issues of alienation and estrangement in uh, modern on, and modernist cases of art. But precisely this was the re reason probably why Plato excludes poetry and art and even theater from polis because uh, he thinks that, well, uh, the goal of art 
uh, is common good and only such art should exist which produces common good and deals with common good and mark the difference common good uh, and not the evil but to get common good you first have to go through evil and come out of it with certain result uh, of um, uh, somehow surpassing it uh, now uh, Plato's idea was that why uh, allow art to deal with it when uh, polis or philosophy can deal with common good and its um, goals much better. <clears throat> and well, uh, I will be skipping uh, and if we uh, now um, make this leap into romanticism, uh, the uh, cru crucial figures will be the embodiments of e evil, like Frankenstein, or like Lord Byron's Kine, or like Baudelaire's uh, Fleur du Mal, uh, the flowers of the evil, which from then on are not the uh, cases which should be imprinted as suffering on the artist's uh, subjectivity, but rather seen as a fascinating image uh, which can supersede the true and which can supersede the common good, which acquires the role of, starting with modernism, the role of hypocritical, um, um, hypocritical representation of the world. Um, uh, and also this um, um, argument between modernism and socialist realism or the so-called critical realism and modernist practices is also about this. Why dealing with the common good or why dealing with the realist issues when realism is soaked and permeated by evil and it's more productive to become this evil and to represent it rather than hypocritically and coercively uh, attempt uh, that uh, there, there can exist some kind of proper ethics um, uh, in, in common sociality. Uh, so this is precisely what I mean by negative genealogy of art, when art has to accept uh, uh, evil uh, rather than hypocritically surpass it, and such an acceptance is also the outcome um, of the facts that numerous revolutions, social struggles have been defeated and we have historically this experience of inability to apply uh, emancipatory beliefs in their uh, realization. And I would um, uh, uh, provide a quote from the text uh, itself. Uh, uh, the Western avant-garde in capitalist conditions does not find a way out of this predetermination for evil. Therefore, sensuousness, which Hegel considers the principal means by which to pursue truth in art, is not simply an aesthetic method. Sensuousness is the technique for the voluntary choice of self-resignation for the sake of reaching the true and the common good. And actually, in his anesthetics, this is what Alain Badiou is also writing, that the truth is a much more appropriate goal for art uh, than uh, um, uh, perception or aesthetic um, uh, aspects. And I'm continuing with the quote, yet if the very idea of gaining truth is discredited as conceited pretension, then sensuousness as the tool uh, that can achieve truth is redundant, it's not necessary. Genuine truth then is the impossibility of truth. Hence, sensuousness as the aesthetic medium through which evil is confronted is dismissed and profaned. And this is when sensuousness is not simply an aesthetic means, uh, but it's also the means of reaching certain ethical condition and certain conditions of touching upon reality. Uh, 
uh, and just to finish the quote, when truth has to be dismissed from art, then power inevitably becomes the principal ethical medium with the it. Um, now, I'm not making any judgments uh, about it. I'm saying that uh, I like this condition that evil is accepted. Uh, and I would rather stand with it that it's honest to see the evil and to keep aside with the evil when evil uh, occupies the bigger part of the sociality or being, rather than uh, pretend uh, that there are some other um, uh, illusions about uh, amelioration and um, uh, affirmative practices. And now I try to connect uh, this acceptance of um, evil in modernism uh, with how it ends up in certain poetics of contemporary art, such as ready-made or such a, as necessity to conceptualize, and first and foremost, uh, such as um, the necessity to understand art as self-sublation. Because this is, f uh, to my mind, the main poetics of art, that it self-sublates itself. And we know that this happened in uh, Western avant-garde, and it happened also in modernism, that um, art's statement about itself was about extermination of its, old, uh, of its own artness, and the speculation about art due to this nullification. The first modernist practices show us this attitude and attachment to annihilation, like Black Square already, or the ready-made, or the 433, or the is representing certain evil which you see as evil. But it's, in certain sense, this um, honesty with negativity, uh, which certain poetics of uh, contemporary practice, practice of self-sublation of its positivity, of its aesthetic positivity, is demonstrated in, um, in conceptualization and in languages that allow, allow art to self-sublate itself, but also, which is very important, to bureaucratically establish nothing and then make out of this negativity um, a, a value. And uh, Diedrich Diedrichsen is uh, with us here, I'm very thankful, who wrote about surplus value in art and who wrote about metaphysical index in art and um, who wrote about uh, that this accusation of art that it produces value out of nothing, and this is accusation that which we get very often from simple audiences, from our grandfathers and grandmothers, um, is not uh, justified because we should see this value and this surplus in a broader sense, not as uh, an abstract labor, uh, but as living labor. So um, certain sort of general intellect which is dissipated through sociality and therefore when we see, for instance, Maurizio Catalan's, um, what is this title? Comedian. Comedian. Um, we should not accuse uh, the artist that it costs nothing, but the cost or the value is dispersed throughout the sociality in education practice, in the education of the artist, in the lifespan of the artist and many other artists or many other institutions who are intertwined with this artist. Or, or this is um, the way I understood um, uh, Diedrich's point. And I, uh, on the one hand, I agree with it, uh, definitely. Uh, this speculative element uh, and this theoretical investment of art uh, into its own body is crucial. Uh, and of course, theory can also be understand as, uh, understood as living labor. On the other hand, if this were simply 
uh, shift from concrete work or the abstract labor to living labor, the establishment of the power of artists' influence or artworks' influence would not be so strong. I think that this bureaucratic uh, gesture of establishing one piece of art as if it were an institution which either negates other uh, artworks or other historical period, periods. So this um, capacity for the um, influential gesture and legitimation, leg uh, legitimization of this ge gesture is even more important. But even this establishment and even these bureaucratic gestures I see within the uh, within the shift uh, from common good to evil. So, both in theory and art practice, alienation we see start I mentioned, but it was important for French post-structuralism as well uh, mm. in the works by uh, Jean-François Lyotard, for instance, who wrote The Inhuman, and who, unlike other uh, theorists uh, like Foucault and Deleuze, who didn't know much of contemporary art, he uh, he was very interested in art and uh, he developed this idea of the inhuman, uh, inevitably inhuman, which is also some sort of um, um, paraphrase of what evil is, but the point is that instead of de-alienating the alienated, and our sociality is alienated, definitely, um, one should intensify this alienation. And he constantly, in many of his works on theater, on art, on uh, philosophy, and even in his work on libidinal economy, he emphasizes the, the point of intensifying alienation and then deviating from capitalism, not through de-alienating capitalism, but through intensifying this uh, alienation and making monstrosity even more monstrous. Uh, which is also the case of talking about uh, evil. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I would say that in art, uh, the, this bureaucratic and institutional establishment of power of the annihilated parameters. And what are these annihilated parameters? Of course, ready-made is representing uh, annihilation because it's nothing, it's just simply an object. Uh, and then endowing this uh, annihilated emptiness with surplus value, uh, this establishment acquires bureaucratic value and bureaucratic power and becomes the value production for the art gesture uh, that, uh, of course, uh, was produced by certain dispersed uh, type of uh, labor um, uh, but um, it was never a concrete work or uh, uh, a concrete um, effort or a concrete sacrifice of an artist uh, investing into precisely this piece of uh, work. Uh, and um, um, uh, what is important uh, that uh, this gesture produces not simply concept, object, or idea, um, uh, which could be the case with any intellectual work, right? So we can say, oh, okay, intellectual work, professors who are reading the lectures, they aren't they laboring? Aren't they working? Of course they do. Uh, of course they sit in the library and read and then... Uh, spend time uh, at the lectures, but I think what art does in its uh, treatment of certain theoretical issues or conceptual issues, it, um, or as uh, Koshut tells uh, us, it's not simply philosophy uh, instead of art, but it's quasi-philosophy or it's art after philosophy. So uh, it produces quasi-concepts, quasi-objects, quasi-ideas, and quasi-theory in certain sense. Um, mm, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm finishing now. I was a little bit long. Um, so 
uh, this is the, the reason allegedly why uh, Adorno would be so negative and skeptical uh, about social engagement and which probably uh, all, all through the way of observing what happened with uh, uh, social practice in art can show us that um, it always was believed that social engagement is certain sort of oasis within art which can uh, somehow overcome uh, this negativity. And my colleague and my professor in London, uh, John Roberts, he even wrote a lot about uh, engaged practices and, and about new forms of labor, which w uh, new forms of uh, labor within sociality that could transform uh, this negativity of art into some sort of quasi avant garde practices. Uh, but at the same time, I'm just alleging that um, uh, uh, these beliefs with the election of uh, conservative governments, uh, with the defeat of Occupy movements, with the war that is taking place at the moment, uh, with the way art was treated during the pandemic, with all those experiences, it was not so powerful as to claim its own uh, social agenda. And now I will uh, say why, for me, um, why I stand with the evil and why I think that evil should not be um, concealed uh, and negativity should not be concealed in art practice and that probably what was the problem with the socially engaged art in terms of poetics um, in its affirmation at attempt to get over negativity uh, is the controversy which and controversy and mutation which I uh, somehow would like to emphasize. So what is this controversy? So why uh, social engagement would be hypocritical or would not be um, uh, functioning uh, properly? Because on the level of the rhetoric of resistance and critical discourse, uh, such practice claims uh, democratic sociality and public engagement, but when it comes to the rules of validation of this art, and when it comes to the regimes of recognition within institution of these kind of practices, for instance, uh, practices of Althammer or uh, the, 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 the works of, um, lots of works from institutional critique as well, starting from Andrea Fraser up to, um, up to uh, Artur Zmijewski. So when it comes to re uh, regimes of recognition of such art, its counter-aesthetic aspects are evaluated not by social merits, not by social political merits, but they are validated due to the extent of art's self-sublatedness in these works. So they are valid for art institution uh, not as social success of its own engagement, but as the extent of abstraction and nullification and annihilation that it accomplishes of these artistic things due to um, dissolution into social practice. So it, in, in a certain sense, um, abuses the avant-garde poetics to put it uh, uh, within the uh, institution and valorize and legitimize uh, the institutional power of, uh, of such a thing when, when the artist always can say, okay, this was not socially effective, uh, but I mean, it is not art and I proved you why it is not art and why it is not uh, why it is destroying or deconstructing certain acknowledged artistic parameters. And uh, my piece um, accomplished this, this. Now the question can be 
I know lots of curators who are absolutely not agreeing with me, and I'm not a curator, and I don't work per se as visual artist and as contemporary artist per se. I, I more deal with dramaturgy, but um, uh, the rebuke which I get from curators um, who work with decolonial practices, who work with um, lots of communities and their uh, artistic activities, uh, they tell that this af affirmation and this affirmative engagement um, uh, exists. Uh, it exists in care practices and, uh, well, generally, um, even if we take the shift from conceptual practices to metamodernist or post-conceptual practices, we see the farewell to negativity. These practices bid farewell to negativity, both in the richness of images, digital images, both in the richness of rituals and body practices um, intervening into this uh, rigid uh, art uh, context and uh, as well uh, the performative breadth of um, non-European uh, practices and um, indigenous practices that are also becoming part and parcel of artistic space. Uh, it is also the case and therefore, for instance, um, I get a rebuke from a wonderful curator like Joanna Varsha, who works with the Roma artist, uh, that she knows nothing about uh, this, uh, you know, this genealogy or genesis of European moder uh, modernism and its um, uh, negative uh, genesis, but she simply produces certain um, extremely powerful uh, piece of. Um, art practice, so how to deal with it, with it, with it and why this um, art would not be affirmative and why we should necessarily label it as still negative. And now I will be explaining why. Um, well, first and foremost, um, when we were speaking about pre-modern practices, which did not yet petrify themselves up to abstraction and form, we were dealing uh, with, not simply with aesthetics, but art was dealing with the event. So with what happened. To understand and to somehow deeply go into what happened, one needs uh, an incredible uh, effort. And uh, as I said, it's not simply something affective, because affect is easy, right? But this sensuous practice that Hegel talks about is about Erlebnis too. So living through this event and articulating and somehow um, um, picking out what happened. Now, even if you have lots and lots of socially engaged practices, they do not prove that the excess, this umbilical cord with the event was taking place. So I can believe in the good. I can claim that I believe in the productivity of, of this and that practice. But whether my practice organizes and accomplishes this umbilical cord with the event, and whether I access this event, uh, there is no proof. So my idea is that Haneke accesses this event, and contemporary artists simply don't work with this poetics. They don't access this uh, event. Therefore, their practice honestly uh, remains uh, negative uh, and it cannot evade the evil um, in its transformation into the non-evil because this was the uh, actually incredible 
uh, attempt of, of the artist, artist, of a poet, poet, of the grand artist uh, as we know it in the history of art. Um, and uh, then the last but not least, um, also why this negative type of art actually is hypocritical when it attracts audience because when audience sits in the ancient Greek theater, it is shown uh, and the artist shows the discovery of the event, but the sacrifice which he experienced as the result of searching for the event. And this is the demonstration of this sacrifice to the audience because what happened always happened to someone and always happened to human beings. And uh, it somehow mm, uh, attracts human beings as part and parcel of this eventality. Whereas uh, um, uh, if I cannot speak about the event and if I did not discover its cornerstone, um, I attract the audience formally, so they cannot be the witnesses of, of, this, of this event. So I cannot, I simply have no right to attract them because I cannot prove that this event was discovered by me and that I somehow went through certain trip, like Orpheus went through the trip to discover and transform then this into poetry or music. Uh, this is the reason uh, why for me uh, uh, um, impossibility or incapacity to deal with the event or incapacity of our historical conditions to deal with the event honestly brings about much more an Adornian position and uh, I think that contemporary post or metamodernist uh, conditions uh, when we have decolonial breakthrough, uh, cybernetic posthumanist breakthrough and performative breakthrough, um, they um, are um, somehow um, destroying this, uh, under this Adornian understanding of why art had to remain negative and evil. <laughs> I would thank you. Uh, thank you, Kitty, for this very dense and, um, yeah, uh, systematic um, walk through, not only through the text you, uh, you shared with us, but also beyond the text. Um, I hadn't said that in the beginning. I, when I when I read your work, I thought it's it's certainly the most systematic author we have invited so far for Crit Cross, and um, yeah, and a way what you what you helped me to do is to to indeed you touched on on many of the essential points that I had also seen when I was reading your text, and I would like to go back to the text and and sure. maybe take it from there. Yeah. Not a judgment day business. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yes, uh, criticism, <laughs> evaluation grounded on reasons, maybe. Yeah. You know. Uh, so uh, in the beginning of of your text, and I'm I'm going to quote that, so we we have this common basis to to discuss uh, immediately. You talk about. Um, so the text is called. We didn't mention the name of the text. I didn't mention it. I realized afterwards. So it's called Evil Surplus, Power. Uh, the three media of art, and it was published in EFLEX, so the main text we're discussing. Um, you say, in avant-garde rhetoric, rhetoric as appropriated by contemporary art, the ideas of social engagement and artistic achievement have been almost identical. After art self-sublation, Selbstaufhebung in, in German, yeah. That was, uh, I, I've, I hadn't understood it quite in the text, but now that you went back to it, I, I have a clearer vision of while you're talking about the self-sublation, in our, after art self-sublation, its principal goal has supposedly been social engage, engagement. Yet despite the internalization of the avant 
Gart's socially oriented legacy, the true episteme and achievement of art since the 1960s has been conceptual surplus rather than social involvement. And the negative antisocial character and vicious genealogy inherent to art since early modernist practices fostered various manipulations of this conceptual surplus, which eventually turned into the surplus value, the metaphysic that makes um, also in a certain sense the, the black square exist. Mm -hmm. So um, that you connect it to, to economics, which is something, do, do, I, do I see that rightly or is that, is that, um, that it also is, for me, the, I, I'll, I'll develop one step further and then uh, hopefully we can talk about it again. For me, this really connected now in the, in the current context also to the idea of enrichment by Luc Boltanski and Arno Esquer, where the idea is that there's some goods that are enriched by, in, in their case, they speak about narrative, but I'm wondering whether the operation of conceptual art, which positions itself as a kind of anti-institutional operation and takes away from the object, whether you would say that it's actually an operation of enrichment of goods, giving them a surplus value, which then mm. makes them precisely tradable, um, mm. which could be linked to the idea uh, of, well, of enrichment. Uh, yeah. well, thank you, because uh, it means you understood what I was saying. Um, um, uh, actually, um, uh, on the one hand, yes, I agree with your rendering uh, of the logic, uh, but on the other hand, I would not say that this deals with economic enrichment straightforwardly, because the surplus that we talk in case of art is not simply surplus value which we have in any commodity. Um, which definitely is a huge surplus in comparison with the use value. Uh, but certainly art deal, deals with incredibly huge surpluses. And that's why probably uh, Diedrich Diedrichsen calls it metaphysical. Uh, so uh, it cannot even exist in any commodity and cannot be uh, explained uh, by Mm, concrete uh, production and investment of labor uh, or even fixed capital into it. Neither fixed capital nor the labor invested into it can stand for this surplus that originates in it. But this is precisely the evil that I see. And this is, the, this is a Nietzschean, uh, Nietzschean joy, like look how evil it is. And, <laughs> um, and Mm, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think acknowledgement of this and ignoring of this uh, is not doing favor to art because these processes constantly happen and sometimes they are not, uh, they are criticized by uh, contemporary art critique and theory and I mean, only the lazy people did not criticize conceptual art for gaining bigger values, uh, although they were uh, absolutely non-commercial and although they were based in the immaterial issues and uh, they were far from monetization. But, but of course they monetized. And this monetization is not merely in real money. This monetization is even symbolic because symbolic impact of them and their influence and their power of the what they mean in history is also is also um, economic and it, it even if it doesn't exist in concrete realization of cost it still is uh, um, uh, a value and it, it still is a surplus value but I would also emphasize one thing you said that conceptual art was not institutional. Well, it was not institutional precisely, it was not institutional precisely because it was an institute. It was a, um, uh, a bureaucratic gesture of an artist uh, tries to exclude oneself from the institution, but at the same time establishes institution ex nihilo. And this was done by 
um, Marcel Bradhurst, like I'm reestablishing museum, I'm critiquing institution, I'm destroying institution, but I'm reestablishing re institute by my work. This was done by all institutional critiques because they would not exist without this bureaucratic instituting. Mm. And this instituting deals precisely with establishment of power. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I don't know whether I made it clear. Okay, you know, I, I think that's a um, very, very important point um, you're making. And um, one, one thought that, that sprang to mind um, listening to you about this question of the evil that's there and the kind of celebration of evil. Of course, we could say that basically that's what, you know, comedian does. It's like saying, hey, I, I have the conceptual power to tape this to a wall and by virtue of me being established within a certain uh, institution, of course, and his institution is also a gallery, so talking about this uh, comedian again is this um, Maurizio Catalan banana that was taped to the wall in the art fair and that was sold for 130,000 or something like that, that basically everybody, me included, I guess most people had seen this as a kind of maybe footnote or mocking of conceptual art, but would you say that this principle that Maurizio Catalan then mocked and inscribed was already inscribed in the early course, conceptual art? It was already inscribed and it's good. I mean, only such art is good. Mm. The, the mocking <laughs> art, you mean, or? Yeah, because, I mean, um, even, well, of course I don't think so, but... <laughs> But um, I was recently uh, seeing um, uh, a work of, uh, in, in Kunstwerke of um, Mayerus, uh, there was a, a deceased artist, the painter who died very young, 34, and uh, his works were made in the early 90s. And you see this radical Dadaist gesture um, when, when he still has this arrogance, uh, but nowadays this arrogance would not be valuable because art went in, into more, um, art became more ecological, I would say. So it cannot, it's too sovereign. So who are you to, to tell me this, you know? Uh, and uh, so art is not that arrogant, but this arrogance that you see in these works of the 90s, uh, it's totally cynical, and this, is, this cynicism is discussed uh, in reference to conceptual gesture by Peter Osborne as well, very much, and this cynicism diminishes in contemporary practices, I think. Uh, why? Because um, uh, something that we see in the development of metamodern uh, practices as Timotheus Vermeulen is uh, depicting them, uh, it doesn't remember about the loss, right? So, uh, so this is the practice, this is the new generation that already uh, deals with um, floating images, floating digitalities, uh, some floating values. It's more psychedelic, uh, and um, um, it doesn't remember what had been lost, uh, and it's not historicizing the artistic genesis anymore. So uh, it simply deals with certain um, blissful cyborg and already posthuman cyborg which is happy and which does not remember what happened and he or she can deal with this uh, digital non-digital human assemblages or whatever so uh, these are the glimmering practices that um, nowadays do not remember about this negativity and probably um, this will, if it, if it goes on like that, it will somehow destroy the logic of historicizing in art space. But what I wanted to emphasize, um, um, <coughs> when we talk about cynicism, 
and the gimmick and the comedian that you mentioned, uh, uh, I wanted to say that um, uh, the first approach of a person who never had uh, experience in contemporary art is that it mocks me. And uh, there's an article called uh, Singularity uh, by uh, Frederick Jameson. And you know Frederick Jameson criticized fiercely the architecture of modernism and the forms of abstraction that we deal with in contemporary economics. And uh, he is precisely talki talking about the surplus that the art gets by theorizing itself. And it's simply a little bit uh, uh, in a quasi theory theorizes itself and gets uh, some kind of and goes into queen like becomes the queen and uh, he is very critical about this gesture but this gesture constructs the and uh, it is the cornerstone of 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 how to produce um, uh, the conceptual value out of Oh, out of its absence. Mm. I, um, that, that's, uh, it's a great point to, to connect the second passage, which I think really connects to the point from yeah. the other article sure. you shared, where you say, this surplus conceptual element promises explanation but never provides it, so that the idea, concept, and material presentation of the work concatenate to form an indexical machine producing signification gaps that are never resolved but always remain in the realm of nonsense. It is this chaos of cognitive blankness that accomplishes a contemporary artwork and does so in a second, in a moment, even when comprehending the work is impossible semantically or even when the piece's duration lasts for hours or days. And, and I think, I mean, that's something you were also now pointing at, that it's a quasi theory. Most of the times, and then there's the other option, right? There's like the Kossuth. Chair, like chair of Kossuth is also quasi-theory. He's not yeah. serious about the chair, right? He doesn't want to show us what chair is. Uh, so but, but isn't the problem in the Kossuth the op op opposite problem? Namely, that especially the tautology, five words in okay. Blue Neon, that sure. it's, it's so clear that it's uninteresting. Absolutely. It's and not even hinting at a meaning that we don't get, you know? Yeah, but uh, it's uh, assuming this, this it's stupid, simplicity. This blunt and stupid tautology is also this blank element, which is um, yeah, which is destructive enough to nullify meaning. And nullification of meaning is also something that produces this surplus. But uh, something that you read crucial in the concert element, because what is important for Charles Sanders' purse in semiology is that why we pronounce sentences? Because we can produce the third thing. Like, uh, the sentence is always this symbol. We don't simply juxtapose two elements, but we make interpretation of these two elements to glue them into certain sort of judgment. And this is something that is never happening in uh, a conceptual work. Um. And, and here's, here's really an important question for me because it's something that has preoccupied me for a while with, with uh, this kind of art and I would say that a vast majority of contemporary art is concept conceptual even when it's not positioned as being conceptual because basically even yeah, this a is painter my point is pushed also. Right, to, to theorize their work even if they have no theoretical interest sure. in art school and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, Elkin somewhere says there's a feeling of meaning so they produce a feeling of meaning, but that meaning can never be grasped. And now the question is, for me as a philosopher, of course, this scandalizes me. And I'm like, they are, you know, they're pretending to say something, actually they're saying nothing. Right? So, so it's like they're tricking me. It's a trick. It's a trick of conveying yeah. the uh, feeling. Jameson calls it gimmick. Yeah, exactly. But now, <laughs> uh, after a few years, I'm wondering whether our position actually is right or whether people could not say, that's exactly what art is able to do, basically yes. convey the feeling of meaning without providing that meaning, and that's what makes it somehow different uh, from philosophy and what yes. makes art of like course. specific. Yeah. But is it, a, is it then not a strength of art some, rather than something 
Yes, that we should I, I totally agree. It's absolutely the strength of art. Only what I'm saying that this strength of art should not be disguised in some sort of goody goody uh, clothes like we all want like, art speak. Uh, yeah. like we all want uh, everyone to be happy and we are uh, contributing to people being happy and to people to just uh, improve their living conditions or whatever um, of course this is critique of social conditions Santiago Sierra is definitely in, in its radical negativity, critical, but more important than uh, um, uh, sympathizing with the bereaved or sympathizing with the um, oppressed is, uh, is this negative gesture that uh, he accomplishes and uh, um, produces this circuit of a circuit of, uh, of, of the absence of hope. I think that conceptual art is precious for this absence of hope rather than uh, direct uh, critical access to engaged uh, practice. And engaged practice could take place and could happen and also I'm, I'm all for it, but when it uh, takes place as your life decision. So not as your art project, but as the social condition, which was the case, for instance, for Sergei Tretyakov, when Benjamin writes about Sergei Tretyakov. And this, this was the lifestyle. I mean, they, uh, they really um, transform the type of writing so that they do not write uh, a classical novel, but uh, all the writers work with the um, uh, collective farms or the workers or the plants. But what is most important thing in avant-garde practice uh, is that you are not depicting somebody's misery and you are not helping someone, but this someone is the subject who teaches you. So this is what this was important in avant-garde and this was uh, the, the most uh, crucial element. Uh, that it's not that I am the subject because I am uh, a subject of theory and subject of judgment, um, but I am someone who is taught but s by, by the conditions of social labor and social truth. I don't think that something like that is, well, it might be happening, but I don't think that this is a, a general condition of broadly how um, how the social continuity between the middle class leftist artist and the uh, laboring um, uh, communities takes place. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for this, for this example, which is, is really an interesting for me vision of what socially engaged art could be or, or can be rather than, I wrote this text, it was called Getting Away With Being an Amateur where I argue that a lot of things, you know, are bad community organizing, pretending that they art, bad painting, pretending that they art, bad programming, pretending that they art. And basically you can say, I'm deconstructing programming by betting, making a bad computer game. No, a bad computer game doesn't deconstruct programming, it's just a bad computer game. And, and so there's this, that's kind of the way One I see most socially engaged art uh, today. Yes. But, um, but whereas your vision had this kind of, has this uh, exigence or this demand of a deeper engagement and not just gesturing towards engagement or making these micro-engagements that produce only, I would say, symbolic capital or conceptual surplus rather than doing anything either for the people or conceptually. And that's, I mean, that, that's my problem with, with a lot of these people. Yeah, practices. but uh, we have a lot of community production as well in these practices, but uh, I was talking with my students recently and one of my students is writing um, uh, research uh, on anarchist, anarchist practices and certain sort of exodus practices when a community is exiting sociality to exist, uh, like Tikkun for instance, about which uh, Georgia Agamben writes, who just desert like this capitalist society, and they try to exist on other terms somewhere else. Mm, and he was telling me that 
he could not explain to himself how this community can open up for a broad uh, transformation and uh, was only seeing that these communities are quite hermetic. Uh, but <clears throat> what I notice uh, now, uh, nowadays when I observe uh, the discourse of minorities, the discourse of indigenous uh, emancipation and the decolonial uh, practices is that Mm, these communities can exist uh, in a close constellation and simply organize some sort of um, ecosystem of closed systems like monads which are connecting. And of course it will not transform sociality drastically, uh, but it will produce some sort of um, uh, um, well, ecosystem in certain sense, uh, when, uh, when you have too many communities which try to be uh, against certain hegemonic type of uh, subjugation, uh, then probably they organize into certain sort of, I mean, this is new utopian idea uh, within the colonial practice of how uh, different temporalities, different communities, which do not want to communicate with each other, because I don't see that uh, a Pakistani uh, Islamic figure wants to communi communicate with a Hasidic community, but they can very well coexist uh, in certain ecosystem. Uh, and they all are counter-capitalist in a certain sense, because they have these counter-capitalist elements within their community. Uh, so, I mean, for me, this is a question, but what I see that contemporary discourse uh, bid farewell to these big ideas of big revolution or just unified revolution or unified transformation, uh, claiming that this is not possible, that these communities will never be unified under one understanding of what emancipation is. Therefore, decolonial critique criticizes Marx so much because Marx sees this political economic logic as unified logic globally. I cannot answer this question at the moment, uh, but uh, I would say that uh, this tendency to turn community-based uh, closed emancipation within one community into ecosystem uh, becomes the utopia of uh, contemporary Post, post contemporary Western sociality, maybe, which integrates into it the non Western subjectivities as well. Um, I, I have a few questions that I don't want to let you get away without, but uh, I would also like to offer the possibility to um, people who are here if you have some, some thoughts or comments on these first um, aspects of our, of our discussion. Is there any, any remarks, questions as of yet? If not, I will ask one of these questions. <laughs> you, you kind of affirm, as nearly self-evident, to be honest, the self-sublation of art. This idea that, that, of course, Duchamp's fountain is a form of Aufhebung of art, or that the Malevich, um, the black square, is an uh, Aufhebung. But of course, the more traditional narrative, and I'm not sure which of the two narratives I believe, would be that they are just showing what the essence of art is, that they're reducing art to its essence rather than destroying it, rather than, than aufheben. So, so I'm, I'm wondering what the concept of art is that you would apply to necessarily say that, you know, Duchamp's fountain needs to be an aufhebung. Is it the sensuousness that's... Mm -hmm. That's the yeah, it's a very criteria. good question. You are smart. <laughs> um, well, um, the fact that art wants to somehow specify its essence is already a non-artistic thing. It, it wants to find its own speculative and um, institutional and meta-institutional condition. 
So when it searches for its own meta-institutional condition, it steps out of its own immersed imminent production. Because this immanence, if you read Kant, if you read even Ranciere, they still worship this Kantian idea of uh, um, transcendental empiricism or, or certain immanence which is there even within uh, aesthetic production and aesthetic uh, experience and perception. Uh, so, um, in this act, it is not perception that is crucial and therefore uh, this perceptive element um, is sublated. But it's um, uh, the <clears throat> speculation about what art had to be. Uh, so it's already uh, uh, stepping out of uh, how I perceive and the immanence okay. and reestablishes art. Of, and uh, you are right, this, this is the essence of art, precisely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so if that's stepping out of art and of the immanence, what would be the immanence and what would be the essence mm -hmm. of art in, in your kind of vision? What is artistic immanence? Uh, I mean, artistic imminence uh, is something when you don't talk about art. This is the paradox. So, so a sort of self-evidence? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, look at the uh, painting. I mean, nobody speaks about art. Art is imminent. And this is Hegel's point. When art talks about art, it stops to be art and it starts to be philosophy. Because... Uh, I mean, once you have artistic experience as uh, perceptive richness, uh, and uh, Hegel talks about the Greek, cult uh, Greek sculpture, he says that in Greek sculpture, uh, the immanence of body and its immanence to idea of the human, m the meaning of the human is identified, it's simultaneous. And when there is split of cognitive and sensuous, and more and more remote, they become more and more remote, then uh, uh, you, you don't deal with, with the imminence, allegedly. Mm. Which, which then brings in this concept of sensuousness, which I find really interesting as well in your, in your discussion. And um, I have another quote, which maybe we can then use to, to develop this yeah. point a little bit where you're talking about uh, the Copernican shift uh, theorized by Adorno as the tragic condition of art. He showed that discarding aesthetics as the regime of sensuousness was the stoic choice of the courageous who had to inevitably stand up to evil. For Adorno, any attempt to use sensuousness to talk about the true and claim any utopias against evil would be ridiculous after the Holocaust. This was why the stake of negative counter-aesthetics was in the ultimate nullification of artistic sensuousness in reaching art's zero degree. Kind of another way to talk about this sublation, right? And, um, and, I'm, and then you say this was not because such a condition was desired, but because it was inevitable under the conditions of the alienated capitalist economy and society. Is that you speaking or is it still quoting Adorno? No, because this yeah, inevitable... No, I'm complimenting. I'm, yet, I, I'm complimenting Adorno because after Adorno there were lots of theorists who said the contrary thing. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, there is Brian Holmes that is writing a huge um, research about uh, act activist practices. Um, but when I look, for instance, at uh, post-Soviet activist practices, um, elsewhere or even in uh, lettrism uh, in, in the 50s of France, um, uh, the activist element uh, is quite destructive in certain sense. Uh, and... Uh, um, conceptual and negative parameters, they are always exceeding the um, uh, social affectivity. I mean, if you can name to me the concrete case when an art practice 
permanently stays in the society as legal transformation and acknowledged parliamentarily, then I will be very grateful. Uh, so probably its activity, its investment, its contribution to the social practice, but the time span which can accomplish this contribution we cannot observe it. Whereas during avant-garde, we could do that because the avant-garde artists had social power. I mean, they, they, really, they re really were in charge of organizing institutions, um, deciding uh, which audience, uh, what the audience should do in terms of labor and activity. So, uh, uh, their input into sociality cannot be compared uh, with the investment or contribution of the artist uh, today. But this was a very short period before Stalinism, when Stalinism totally uh, destroyed this um, practice and this opportunity, um, turned into this um, uh, artificial practice of uh, socialist realism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it seems to be a, seems to be another kind of uh, example of art engaging with politics in a more direct way, rather than creating political works, actually shaping politics as well as citizens, right? Sure, uh, I mean, uh, I'm all for um, public forms of art, uh, but uh, in them I don't see uh, what happened to the society. And paradoxically, I see much more what happened to the society in comedian, in the comedian of Maurizio Catalan. And this was, by the way, why Adorno was talking that when you try to make in your art total negativity and when you try to be, when you try to produce andere, so when the work of art is absolutely an encrypted object which cannot be read by middle class or bourgeoisie or non-bourgeoisie or working class, Nobody can uh, accept it as the work of art. And this was also ideality and utopian because then uh, the uh, radical uh, conceptual art also becomes com comprehensible. But uh, when he was claiming um, uh, this negativity, he meant that this is negative mimesis. So uh, to a certain extent, um, Andy Warhol's uh, can of Coke uh, is also a social piece of art because it really reveals the uh, the mode of sociality that forms this type of economics. Probably in terms of analysis of economics, it's more um, eloquent than uh, than other affirmative practices would be at that time. I don't know. Maybe we should write an alternative history of social, <laughs> socially uh, relevant art. Um, yeah, are there more more questions? I just realized that it's already nine yeah, o'clock. It's, it's already nine o'clock, um, and I could go on. Yes, thank you for your lecture, and uh, just to um, to return to um, um, categories as uh, living labor or um, intensification or of alienation. So um, I just want maybe to think uh, a bit um, concretize about um, what uh, exactly you meant by intensification of alienation, and then. Yes, in terms of uh, living labor or um, uh, um, value of art as uh, nothing. So I also understood it uh, from the position of dramatic or post-dramatic theater. And every point uh, have, uh, every category has its 
own critics, for example, in post-dramatic theater, um, it's um, kind of, um, or digital architecture, or, um, or a cri um, 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 relational aesthetics also has its own um, history of critics, kind of recreate Tiravania. Uh, Tiravania opened his um, restaurants and then everybody goes there at two o'clock to eat, so it's kind of not transversal thing at all. It's kind of, um, yeah, from the standpoint of creation of something new. And then, but from another side, if you take um, this um, um, point of view about um, digital architecture or post-dramatic theater, it's kind of showing some tra transcendental horizon, which is kind of we um, s uh, sensuous communities, we, um, we see it, um, and then maybe some certain shift in some certain mind can come in some group of people and then this idea about that it's kind of, then this shift comes and um, then more objects like this, it's um, uh, then the world will get better or maybe then, yeah, and um, or diversity in art in general, like um, when this um, expansion of all the categories of art, um, uh, all the mixtures of transdisciplinarity, cross-disciplinary strategies and everything, and then, and then this uniform idea of art that um, art will come, mm, uh, the more traditional way of art, they are coming, bec becoming more beautiful. Then it's get ex expanded so on, so, so big, so then the traditional ways of doing the art, for example, working with traditional media is kind of maybe also could take its place and then it's about the whole idea of diversity. And, um, and then, uh, then the, uh, uh, there is also yeah, certain critics of uh, dra dramaturgy and dramatic theater because there is, it's kind of against um, emancipatory ideas. And then just to conclude, yes, so, uh, is there is any certain point for critics of any thing of it? Because, um, yeah, I don't Criti know. A, a, a critics of what? Uh, critics of any kind of um, standpoint uh, of as um, critics um, of um, yeah, th these two um, categories from which I started, from living labor um, and um, um, value of nothing, or it's, um, as you, you were um, in saying, intensification of alienation and evil. Yeah, so just as also in, in our university recently, there was P Peter, and Peter Osborne was lecturing, and he kind of um, put it everything into category of generic art, or post-conceptual art, which is kind of um, just uh, distributing uh, critical social or um, gr grounding of certain subjectivity in uh, the work of art. So um, yeah, if, I, I if we have no such capacity of critical thinking, like as I know you propose sometimes that uh, the most, uh, most uh, contemporary way of uh, making art is to escape the, um, the field of uh, contemporary art, as I, as I also understood from, from this l lecture, that um, this kind of, um, this kind of um, uh, mm. never-ending um, uh, field, we never know when it will finish, so as I, mm -hmm. as I understood your propo proposing, so well, uh, you touched upon many, many points, and I try to uh, uh, react on uh, at least a few. Well, your first question was, what does it mean to alienate alienation or intensify alienation? Uh, I think it's simply the practice that is uh, characteristic for uh, post-68 um, uh, 
uh, despair and um, disappointments. Uh, so all those disappointments that ended up in not believing the social transformation, they ended up in uh, deserting the Marxist point. And when all the disciples of Althusser, for instance, they stopped to be uh, Marxists and uh, uh, insist that uh, socially this transformation is not possible. So we should use what is evil. And what is evil? It's capitalism. So instead of stepping out of capitalism, we should remain in capitalism and become even more capitalist than capitalist. And capitalists will be, will be uh, absolutely scared by our monstrosity. <laughs> it will shift or deviate itself from its logic. Uh, so uh, if, you read, if you read through all post-Althusserian uh, philosophy or theory, it's, it's one and the same thing. Uh, and uh, this was meant uh, by me and of course this became part of conceptual art very much because it evolves and takes place and develops precisely in this period, 70s and 80s. Uh, as for what you meant, uh, I mean, um, you spoke long but uh, uh, I didn't quite get why you mentioned post-dramatic theater in this context, in terms of like, you mentioned diversity and you said that maybe uh, we should accept diversity and post-dramatic theater as um, uh, part of this diversity. Could, could you specify? Because I, I didn't quite uh, uh, catch this mention of the post-dramatic theater. It's uh, just uh, as I understood um, the living labor and the creation value of ah, nothing. Okay. So in, in terms of uh, improvisation and what we see in, in uh, many theater right now or many mm. performances and um, some um, yeah, but uh, post, uh, post, yes. it's, it's important that post-dramatic theater, I would not label it and I would not describe it into how mm. contemporary art works and into the context of contemporary art. Therefore, living labor there and living labor in art would, would be different practices and different types of um, labor producing it, uh, I would say. Um, because uh, contemporary arts labor investment is uh, totally theoretical, whereas post-traumatic practices, they are a bit different. Uh, they are within the Institute of Theatre and they remain in the Institute of Theatre um, and they have not become theory so far. Thank you. Yeah. Um, other, other questions, thoughts? Um, do, yeah. I have so many, but I don't want to <laughs> keep everybody to, uh, to that. We can discuss a little bit later. Um, if not, let's um, wrap it up. We can still, can we still have a drink here? Or yeah, yes? Yeah. So we can still have a drink here at Depot. You can also uh, keep the discussion going a little bit with a glass of, of wine or water or, or beer. And thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you. And thank you to Depot for hosting us. Uh, there was no questions online, right? We didn't even ask. Good. Okay. <laughs>